thanks for reminding me because yeah, you definitely want to have this uh, recorded. And I have figured out the YouTube and I'm like, good to go. So uh, thanks. Thanks for reminding me. I'm sure that I, if that doesn't happen every day, it's a miracle. Okay. So where was I? Elizabeth, have you got something? Um, yeah, kind of, I guess. Um, I kind of talked about everything that I really wanted to talk about last period because I've already read this play, but I just want to say again that like Odysseus tried to be this good guy, but he's just like an asshole. <laughs> good. He thinks he's just great, right? He does. He thinks he's the best thing on this planet, but he's, he's like not at all. And like Polynester probably is worse. Yeah. You know, because of everything that he did to Hecuba and her daughters and her sons, especially um, Polydorus. He has no virtues. He's just an even bigger asshole, I guess. He's greedy, right? He's also greedy, yes. He has the wrong goal and he knows he has the wrong goal, right? Yes, but he doesn't do anything about that. Well, not only that, he tries to deceive Agamemnon and the thinking yeah. is not. Yeah, okay. But I think he knows he's rotten. He's just trying to, to, you know, he's stuck. He got caught. He's trying to convince Agamemnon he had good motives, but he knows he doesn't, you know. Does that make sense? So in these plays, there are degrees of bad. <laughs> Right, I think polymester is the worst, and uh, you know you can fight over whether Odysseus or I, I would say polymester is the worst, and then Agamemnon, and then Odysseus, and then um, Hecuba, and then uh, Polyxena is like way up there. <laughs> she's in a totally different. She's outside of the cave, right? They're all in the cave, arguing about stuff when their their minds are corrupted by pride greed delusion pity you know their their mind their noose is corrupted they cannot see what the good is they can't make the right choices um sam is that good enough elizabeth did i yeah of course Okay, Sam, you got something? I would actually like to wait until the after your lecture before okay. I talk. That's okay. Sure. Madeline? Okay, May? Uh, well, for me, I think what strikes me the most is the Aris, uh, Aristotle's values and like viewpoints instead of the story about her Cuba. Like, uh, you still can hear me, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, basically, I think that to reading like Aristotle's virtues, I, I, I was thinking like no one was born like naturally bad, like everyone has good opinion and also they have good viewpoint. And um, it's just like our choice, our decision that, that makes us like happy or not, or like do we, are we different from anyone or not? And also, I, I can feel that I can, I can apply those like virtues to every like situation I see in life, or like can use it to explain many things I used to see in life from my action to other people to like my family or basically to ev to anything. And I also feel that like to that I can feel the importance of education. You know, like to let people see like different things at different viewpoints and to guide them to act like morally and also ethically kind of like that. So I think basically what like impresses me the most is the Aristotle like values and virtues. I think so. Okay, May, very good. Um, education gives you an eye of the soul so that you see differently, right? When you're yes. looking, yeah, when you're looking at people behaving, I said that you don't know what you're looking at 
because you don't know why they're doing what they're doing, right? Yeah. You, so that's why you have to, like these plays are trying to give you, is the person that type or that type? Can you, how do you find out, you know, what sort of character they have and, you know, what they've done in the past. And that's so important for, un well, first of all, you learn a lot of that in your families because those are the people you know the longest time. You can sort of see their characters developing, which again, I didn't have, but all of you do. And then, um, then you figure that these people around you in the public eye, yeah, they have, they have backgrounds, but how do you figure out if they're good actors or not? Because the rhetoric is powerful. Uh, it's one of those themes in the play too. So that's great. Um, Louis, do you have something? Yeah, I went to skip today. Oh, you're going to skip. Okay. Yeah. Till the end. Uh, Jana Tool. Lakin? I'll pass. Okay. Untari? You there? Oops. Oh, okay. Claire? I'm going to wait until the end as well. What? I'm going to wait until the end too. Okay, okay. Oh, she has a sore throat. Okay, yeah, that's okay. I will say, Untari, that in this, um, that Indonesia was a big player in this conference. One of the languages it was translated into, and there was only five or six languages, was uh, Bahasa Indonesian, and there was an, in, uh, an Indonesian band at the end, too. So, bravo. <laughs> um, Fahima. Okay, Margia. Oops, okay. Um, let's see. Let me, um, DT, are you there? Okay, News Rot. Okay, Bondona. Ma'am, uh, like uh, in like five minutes before I got disconnected, and uh, I was wondering what we were discussing because I have wrote few fun about Aristotle. So can I say that? Okay, I yeah, I had the assignments listed and I had the stuff posted, but you can wait till the end. That's fine. Okay, um, okay Rossi. I'll wait till the end, Professor. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So let's go. I'm just going to, you know, I read the whole thing over. And for me, the, now what should be interesting to you, I hope. And because I've read this stuff and I've thought about it a lot, it's so amazing when you realize what they're doing. So Odysseus is an absolute classic Apollo. I hope you can figure that out. Because if you remember, Apollo had all the intellectual virtues. Aristotle's intellectual virtues are, you, you can do science, you can have facts and, and supporting a conclusion. You can give arguments. He's always got reasons for what he does. Uh, uh, calculation, you're good at calculating the means to your end. Um, he, the power of rhetoric is an intellectual virtue. Um, math is an intellectual virtue, right? These are the ones that you come to school to get, right? Math you learn in a classroom. So Aristotle says the intellectual virtues you get through uh, teaching, right? And whereas the moral virtues you get from habituation, practicing, and developing because it's tied to your emotions and your actions. The intellectual virtues you can get in a classroom, 
but they will always get tied to some character. They can get tied to good people or bad people or anybody in between. But he's particularly good at all of these intellectual skills. Um, all right. And remember he had, he, he was indifferent to justice. He switched sides in the Trojan War. So Odysseus has a bad conception of leadership, but he's very good at calculating how to achieve the goal that he set for himself. He just set the wrong goal. And that's why when Hecuba argues with him, Hecuba's right. Um, the other thing about Odysseus is that Remember, Odys remember Apollo chased nymphs in his spare time? He treats women like sugar candy, you know, whatever, like the, just like sex objects. And that's exactly how Odysseus treats women, right? He said, his idea is that the only way I can get the soldiers motivated is to promise them hot sex, you know, with a beautiful young woman. That's so Apollo. <laughs> it's appalling too, but um, I hope people understand that, that first of all, you know, we read about that archetype and we read Aristotle's virtues. And then I had you bring examples. So you might remember the example you brought, right? Or at least we know, you know, that there are examples in the public eye. There's examples, you know, and that's the archetype that you see in this play. So all these things are just kind of woven together to keep reminding you because it's giving you this eye of the soul to see, you know, to see the human condition, to see yourself in the midst of this huge uh, complexity. So when we studied each Greek god and goddess, you just sort of focus your eye on that. And then we had Delphi, the puzzle, life is a riddle. And then, you know, Olympia, they're, they're trying, now they're starting to work together to build these institutions. And now another one of the institutions is the institution of tragedy, having everybody come in from the rural areas, have everybody, it's a big, it's a religious uh, festival they have. And then they're all come and they draw lots. So certain people are just arbitrarily chosen for voting at the end because uh, the public gets to vote on which uh, of the three playwrights they like best. Um, after the play is over, they go down to the taverna. So I'm going to talk to you, unfortunately, just me doing the talking. But this is exactly the kind of I mean, you, I hope you can picture this down at a taverna a restaurant and everybody's talking, right? And they're disagreeing. And like Elizabeth says, Odysseus thinks he's great, but he's such an asshole. And then somebody else might come in and say, wait a second, I sort of like him. I'm like, oh, okay. But anyway, he sure likes himself. And that, remember how when we talked about the Apollo, the boy who was the big achiever and everybody loves them. And um, he has it now some of them, like one of you had a friend where he, his dad was making him achieve everything. He just didn't want it, but he did it, right? So those Apollo types can get caught in these bad situations. But for the most part, they just think they're just hot stuff and everybody, else thinks so too, right? It gets rewarded a lot. So Odysseus is just like that, right? Everybody thinks he's a great leader and he sure thinks he's good and he's not. <laughs> but um, so I hope, I hope you can start to see how all that comes together. Um, all right, so Polydorus, so the play starts where Poly, this Polydorus emerges and that's shocking, right? So everybody's engaged. This little boy got killed by Hecuba's friend that she trusted him with, and he's the youngest heir, and this was her last hope for having Troy come back. And that, 
you know, that's just a shocker right from the start. So he gets everybody engaged. Um, then you have Hecuba is moaning for her dreams and then the chorus. So now you have, you know, the privileged class and the middle class. And I think the relationship between the privileged class, the middle class, and then the slaves is, is always important in tragedy because you can't have a democracy unless the different people at different levels are woven together and they get along and they treat each other with respect. And of course that doesn't happen. Um, so the Greek army convened. Against you have this theme where you have this ecclesia of citizens coming in and the leaders are transparent. They're accountable. They have to explain what decisions they're making and why. And then in this case, the army even voted, right? So in Troy, the ecclesia uh, voted, but the monarch could overrule them if he wanted to. And Agamemnon did overrule the ecclesia, but they, they get in on the debate, citizen consciousness, and they even get to vote. So they're asking, why aren't the winds blowing, right? Why are we stuck here in Thebes? Now, it's important to know that they'd be starving to death if Polymester hadn't let them in and given them hospitality. Just think about it. His people are feeding Agamemnon's troops. They're just, you know, it's a big imposition, but hospitality is important. And you can't have these city states, right? Like we can't have nation states unless we agree. We're not gonna kidnap each other's people. <laughs> uh, if somebody's plane goes down, you're, you're going to, um, you know, pick up the pilot and give them, take them to a hotel or something. Um, okay, so, so the, the story is that they were trying to figure out why the winds don't blow. Odysseus announced that it was the reason was Achilles wants Poly, Polyxena, the sweet young thing, he had promised that the bravest soldier would get the hot sex lady, the nymph. And um, so now Achilles is demanding his, his share. Um, and then Agamemnon originally disagreed. So the soldiers were actually almost 50-50 and Agamemnon disagreed, but because he was sleeping with Cassandra, one of the enemies, right? The soldiers are thinking his judgment is biased because he favors the enemy, right? He's sleeping with the enemy, literally. Um, so then given that it's even, uh, Odysseus comes up and, and the description is that he uses all this rhetoric and he manipulates them. And so like a good Apollo, he convinces them. Um, then Hecuba, another theme in this is do the gods, where are the gods, right? And I, you know, if you have uh, my students at Lyon uh, are raised to think that God is the cause of human events. And so when these awful things happen, where's the God? Well, I think the tragedies are trying to show you that, first of all, this stuff is because of human choice. <laughs> this is, don't blame God for this. This is a human choice. But underneath that, there are these patterns of good and evil, like karma, that do come back, right? Polymester really did an evil thing. And boy, he really got an evil thing <laughs> done to him. And Hecuba really did an evil thing by slaughtering both of his sons. And Hecuba is going to have a very evil thing happen to her. So there is this ultimate sort of karma. But all the way along, people say things like Hecuba says, what God can I trust, right? So Odysseus comes and tells Hecuba and Polyxena the troops voted, I'm coming to get her. 
And he acts like, you know, it wasn't me, it was the troops, <laughs> right? Not my fault. Um, and so, uh, and so Polyzena is sort of the ultimate virtuous person because the first thing she says when she finds out she's gonna get killed, she says, oh, I feel so sorry for you, mother, right? Her mom is a curse, uh, melting. And she just feels sorry for her mother, you know? I'm sorry, mom. <laughs> and um, Odysseus is very pragmatic about it, right? He's always just saying, well, we gotta get this done. Um, it's just the only way to go. I promise the troops, blah, blah. So he's being rational in that, you know, intellectual virtue sense. He's got a strategy, he's got five reasons, but he's still wrong. <laughs> then <coughs> Hecuba gives him some facts. I saved your life, remember that? So this is where they have this little battle because each one of them has facts. And so this is where you get scientific reasoning, but scientific reasoning always has to be attached to an idea of the good, right? What is good ruling? Yes, there's facts here and there's facts here, but the conclusions they come to are based on their idea of leadership. And um, I think Hecuba has a better idea of leadership. She says, um, uh, you can convince them. I mean, it's not hard. You could say, um, I've decided that we're too dignified to kill innocent girls, you know? We should have mercy. We, we won the war. He could convince them that he's still a good leader. Um, he could say Achilles changed his mind. He has mercy, blah, blah. Um, and she warns him. She says, Odysseus, you should use your power carefully because um, uh, luck, luck doesn't last very long. And of course, that's exactly what happens, right? Yeah, Polly Mester uh, abused his power and he his luck <laughs> ran out. Um, so that principle that Hecuba says, plays out in the dialogue. Um, okay. And then Odysseus, yeah, Odysseus at the end, he, he has a corrupt idea of honor. Remember we had rational honor. The city should honor people who go over and above what they need to. And if you remember, Hera was the goddess of honor. So Zeus is the god of justice. So yes, the soldiers all were commanded to go fight, they did, but they get honored if they go above and beyond. So that, um, but Achilles has a corrupt idea of who deserves public honor. And then the final thing was his superiority complex, right? If you weren't such barbarians and didn't violate hospitality agreements, this would never happen to you, right? And that was, that was his final word. Well, of course, two scenes later, Agamemnon is going to violate hospitality agreements in a much more egregious way, okay? Because in Odysseus' case, Paris came over, the Trojan came over and stole Helen, which is terrible, but Helen went willingly. She went with them. She wasn't forced, she chose it. Whereas Agamemnon is violating hospitality by letting Hecuba have a private meeting with Polymester for the express goal of taking revenge. He let her do that. And she, so he's violating his hospitality agreement with Polymester when his soldiers like would be starving if it weren't for Polymester. He violates hospitality and Hecuba kills both of his kids and blinds him, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, Odysseus, sure, you're so superior. I just can't believe how wonderful you are. Uh -huh. Okay, 
so then um, Polyzina, right, toward the end is then she gives this good, great speech and her speech on page 10, it's so amazing, really. And again, you're supposed to think about this. Yeah, this really happens to people. Um, she said, you know, when I was young, I was a princess. I was the daughter of the king. I had every reason to think I'd have a really nice life. And here I am a slave. And so I'd really rather be dead than be enslaved to someone that I have to obey. Um, and so she, she deals with it in a very dignified way. And then, then um, the comment is good breeding. And so that's one of the big themes is that, is she this way because she was bred? This is what may, she was raised that way? Well, I mean, Hecuba and Priam were the mother and father of Paris who started the war because he stole, you know, the hot, the hot sex lady. They're the parents of Hector, who was um, a really, really good guy who loved Apollo. Um, and he unified the Trojans, but he knew they were wrong. He knew his side was wrong. He just tried to keep them together and run the war as well as he could. Um, and they're the parents of Polydorus and Polyxena. And so, I mean, their kids are really a mixed bag. And so you can't blame your parents breeding, right? So the implication there, no, it's her choice, right? It's not just breeding. And so she is making this incredibly noble choice of how to deal with her situation. So it's a model for all the rest of us. Um, and I was thinking with my students at AUW, it's very possible that when you were 10 years old, you didn't think you'd get a full scholarship to this nice liberal arts school, right? And so you're sort of, hopefully you're reminding yourself, you no, know, however bad it is, still, you know, I'm so far, uh, ahead of where I ever thought I'd be. And so then you can keep going. Well, in another 10 years, you might have that AUW degree, you might have a graduate degree, and then you might start thinking you're gonna have this great life. <laughs> and then all of a sudden crash, something happens, right? So you might end up being on the other side of that. Um, but that's just the way life is. Like it has its ups and downs and you can reasonably expect something and it won't happen right either good or bad and so you do have to learn how to figure out choice you know what kind of choice are you going to make in a situation when you have dis disappointed expectations right or what how do you deal with it when all of a sudden you have these incredible advantages are given to you um so so that's just <laughs> uh we all go through that i've been through that but uh, I'm sure all of you will be, or you're in the middle of that too. Okay. So then I did, the play was about divided in thirds. And at the beginning of the second third and the third third, the chorus of women speak. And I think that what it is, it's reminding, it's reminding everybody of our common humanity, right? It's they're human beings and they're talking about how awful that was. Uh, what happened was that the Greeks uh, were able to get inside the city of Troy, um, the Trojan horse, all that. But anyway, they opened the gates and they just completely invaded. And so the women are talking about that night when they were combing their hair, everything seemed totally natural. And all of a sudden, wham, you know, the whole city was completely decimated. Um, and so the, you know, the thought is, if you have power, if you're a leader, don't forget the humanity of the people you're leading. That's why this is humanism. This is education in humanism, ancient humanism. It's very humanistic. It's always trying to remind you, these are people, they're not pawns in your game. And, and then it just becomes that more obvious of the way that Odysseus, Hecuba, 
and Agamemnon talk to each other, they are just oblivious to the humanity of the people whose lives are completely ruined by their bad choices. Okay, so then you had the slave, the Greek slave, right? So Hecuba is the enemy. She's the Trojan. Ah, she's the queen of the enemy. But he's just gone and seen the slaughter of Polyxena, and he's coming back to report it. And the first thing he, he does is he just looks at her and he feels so much mercy and pity for her. And he says, Zeus, how could you allow this, right? I mean, he doesn't think, yeah, she's a rotten ruler. She's a Trojan. He just has this basic empathy, which Hecuba doesn't have, right? And the leaders don't have it. The slave has it. He said, then he also says, I'd rather be dead than to live with this, right? So the plays remind you that even if you have a lower position in society, there are advantages to that too, because a lot of times the children of the leaders, people in power, really do suffer because of that exposure they have. People will gossip about them. People will be critical of them or worship them. You know, they'll corrupt, they get corrupted by it. And their parents are never home. And um, yeah, I mean, I my parents were in the public eye and you know, people you say, oh, I love your dad. He's so great. I said, well, say hello to him for me because he's never home. <laughs> I mean, I never said that, but I mean, that that's the way it is at best. You know, my parents were nice. They were just never home. Um, but anyway, this is a case of where the slave is not complaining about his position in society. He, uh, but the play is reminding you that they need to be treated with respect and dignity. Um, oh, then, um, oh, he tells her to stand up. So he commands her. I think that's interesting. He tells her to stand up. And then she says, are you a friend? And friend is a big deal, right? So yeah, they have a common bond, right? And Hecuba needs to remember that. But of course, she interprets it in this selfish way. Are you going to help me out? You know, rather than, wow, he cares about me. You know, he's a very humane person. Um, so he tells the story about Polyxena and he cries while he's telling it because she's so noble. Um, okay. Um, and in that story, if you remember, um, the soldiers are holding on to her and she says, no, let go, you know, uh, I freely choose, right? She's, she's going to die a free person. She's not going to resist. She's not going to yell in their face. She's not going to, she's going to die a free person. As soon as they let go, she rips open her dress, no hesitation, gets on her knees. Whereas Neoptolemus is hesitating, <laughs> right? He doesn't know if he wants to do this because his judgment, right? Is this really good? So Polyxena knows what's good in the situation and she does it. She has complete integrity. Neoptolemus, no, he's divided because it is really questionable. Um, then after she dies, the troops are really questioning themselves. Maybe that was a mistake. And then they say, put, you know, throw dirt on her body because that's the most important thing. Make sure the body is not exposed to the vultures. Um, and uh, so, so then that, that just shows that Hecuba was right, that Odysseus really should have said, no, we're too dignified because now the troops maybe question everything they've been told. We were told that those Trojans are barbarians, right? Which is what Odysseus told Hecuba. And they aren't, you know, they're noble. So what is this? So, you know, Odysseus ability to lead is completely undermined by this whole event. Um, okay, and then Hecuba says, 
this again, all these claims where they make universal claims, that's again why I like this kind of literature because it is always trying to find the pattern. And so the characters are trying to find the pattern and it's often very ironic, right? So she says, character doesn't change, right? Polyzena was good before she was in that situation. She was good in the situation. She says, um, even good people get singed with badness. Um, uh, so the irony there is that she's saying, Polyzena, nothing can change her. Uh, but Hecuba is about to completely change when she finds out that they kill her son. She just has this complete <laughs> reversal into revenge, right? So, um, so again, it brings up, you make your choices. It's not true that character doesn't change. If you choose to change your character, your character changes. If you choose to act nobly in a situation, that's your character. Um, so, and then she says, wealth and fame are worthless. So it is constantly reminding people not to be jealous of other people's wealth or fame and not to aim for that as your primary goal, right? Always it's you should aim for virtue and justice, even if you make a mistake, because if you don't, you, everybody around you just degenerates. Um, the chorus talks about how Paris's choice led to the whole collapse, keeps reminding you of Paris had a choice, right? Uh, he wasn't naturally bad, he chose to be bad. Um, so then, um, oh yeah, okay. Then there's another one of the, the women who wait on Hecuba brings the body of Polydorus. Um, and that's bad, right? That when she sees this, the body of her youngest son, that means there's no future for Troy. That was her number one duty as the queen was to leave behind a male heir. You know, everything else can ultimately be forgiven as long as you have that one thing for your future of your city. When she finds out her friend killed him for the money, that's it. Um, so she, on the, on the stage, of course, she's, <laughs> she's staring out and Agamemnon is coming in. He doesn't see her face. And this is, again, he says, well, Hecuba, why haven't you buried Polyzena? And then he, they have this superiority complex, right? He says, well, we Greeks take pride in uh, doing things right. <laughs> <laughs> we bury our dead right away. Like, what's your problem, Hecuba? <laughs> it's just, again, it just exposes, stop assuming you are the best person. Stop, keep assuming other people have, you know, they're corrupt and that's why they don't do what it appears to be, to be a mistake. You really have to ask why. Um, stop judging, stop assuming. Um, and then Hecuba decides to take vengeance. And um, she completely, on page 20, she, she knows exactly how to punch his buttons. So where she criticized Odysseus for his uh, rhetoric, she says, um, uh, let's see, I can't do what I need without your help. And she's talking to herself, right? Without his help. So she's sort of talking to herself in the audience. I can't do what I need to do without his help. Why do I waste time debating, right? I debated with Odysseus. I gave him an argument. Why do I waste time with that? Win or lose, he's my only hope of avenging my children. Um, and... She, so she starts out, right? She starts out saying, oh no, this is really good because Agamemnon says, 
look, Hecuba, when we get to Argos, I'll give you your freedom. You know, you don't have to be a slave. You can go and live with your, your maids, right? Now, if she had done that, people would feel sorry for her. And they would probably think the Trojans aren't so bad. And you would get that story about Polyxena. And they would think, well, yeah, Paris was bad, but Helen followed. You know, they'd start to get some nuance and her city wouldn't be demonized so much because, you know, year after year, she's suffering. But she didn't want that. <laughs> she wanted revenge and that gave her city a terrible reputation, right? She represents her city. And so when she took vengeance, it just was, yeah, those Trojans really are barbarians. They really are brutal. Look what she did. So she did have a choice and it has to do with freedom, right? So it, this is about the corruption of freedom. And it came, it was written at a time when Athens was declining uh, because people had corrupt notions of freedom. They were using their choice unwisely. And the play is all about, you are your choices. The worst decisions are made in the, and the best decisions are made in the name of freedom. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the body of my son. Um, Polly Nestor killed him for gold. So she's telling him, Agamemnon, you know, what went on. Um, and, oh, let's see. Okay. There's one point where she says, uh, why do I bother learning any skill but rhetoric, persuasion? It's the only one that really matters. Who cares about truth? Who cares about justice? Why do we work so hard to learn unnecessary things when what we need to know is how to persuade? Without the polished art of persuasion, we can't get what we want. Okay, so you're going to see that that's what happened in Athens, that the educators of the elite, it was supposed to be an education for being a gentleman, being a leader, blah, blah, but it turned into an education in how to persuade. So he's, this is his comment on what's going on out there in Athens. So the people are supposed to be thinking about this. Um, it's a corrupting influence to teach the art of persuasion without also having these people have a strong moral character. Um, so here she is. She's trying to argue with Agamemnon. Um, and this, my God, this is a really artful speech. <laughs> she says, um, see if you think my, see if you think my hardships are justified. If so, good. Um, uh, I won't bother you further. But if, if not, if you don't think it's justified, please help me. Help me get revenge. Um, and then she starts appealing to pity and then to, well, we're the privileged class, you know. Oh, my God. She just appeals to class. Okay. So she says, I can't count the number of times he sat at my table. He was an honored guest. So that's something Agamemnon can identify with, right? He has other dignitaries over. He, uh, you know, he gets this and have some of them turn on him. So he's kind of aware of his vulnerability, right? And um, uh, in thanks, he kills my son. He's a calculated cold-blooded murderer. And I'm nothing but a power, powerless slave, right? So she's appealing to pity. Um, but the gods, okay. So she says, I'm just a powerless slave, but the gods. So <laughs> just listen to this. The gods have power, as does the underlying law that governs the gods. It is by virtue of this law, this basic moral code, that the gods and our belief in them exists. 
and we know right from wrong, good from evil. If you corrupt this law, allowing those who murder guests and violate the gods to go unpunished, you poison the root of our humanity. Justice withers and dies. <laughs> well, I mean, that's true in theory that the God, there is this moral order, but Agamemnon should not give her um, a private conference to take revenge because he depends on Polymester for um, hospitality. So, I mean, if the winds hadn't come up at the end of the play, the Thebans probably would have massacred all of his troops because he allowed Hecuba to massacre their two heirs and to blind their king. I mean, of course they're gonna massacre them. They have complete power over them. Um, and so Agamemnon, he can say, yes, there is a moral order, but I cannot, I'm not God. I cannot enforce it, right? In my position, I'm vulnerable. My troops are vulnerable. But Hecuba just appeals to his pride and his blindness. He, she says, oh, you're gonna represent that highest moral order. Oh my God, Agamemnon, aren't you glad you won the war? You're the most powerful guy in the world. You're free to, to, to bring back the moral order. <laughs> oh, go. Okay, so um, she says, um, step back and think about me. One time I was a royal queen, just like you. So there's this empathy. You know, Agamemnon, one time I was just like you. And so all of a sudden you can identify with her, right? She's been done this huge injustice. Um, let's see. And she even appeals to sex. She says, you know, my daughter, Cassandra, uh, you know, you're getting a lot of pleasure out of that. Don't you want to do me a little favor in return? <laughs> and again, that's the old theme. Whenever they have these women that they use for their uh, war brides, you know, their power. Whenever the sex gets involved as an expression of power, it corrupts the judgment of the leaders. And so once again, Cassandra, the fact that he's staying with it is corrupting his judgment. Um, let's see, lend your avenging hand to this old woman, even though she's nothing. Help her anyway. Do your duty, met out justice, punish this heinous crime, right? Uh, so, and the chorus is kind of looking at this and saying, wow, it is strange how previous enemies are friends and previous friends are enemies and how things ebb and flow. And that's true. I mean, that is true in life. Uh, but that's why you have to be a lot more careful about the choices you make and don't let somebody manipulate you like this. Um, okay, so Agamemnon says, uh, I'm in an awkward position with the army. Again, they would think that I was biased because of Cassandra. Um, uh, I, I can't do it. And he's right that he can't do it. But it's not just because of Cassandra, it's because his troops depend on hospitality. And he doesn't say that, which sort of drives me nuts. But then she says, when he says, I can't do it, she says, and this is really important, then no one is free in this world because Agamemnon thinks he is the most powerful guy in the whole world, right? So if he's not free to do it, well, then no one is free. Well, I mean, you can't tell an Athenian no one is free, like freedom is everything. He's chained to money or to luck or to the majority opinion or to law. Any way you look at it, he's still a slave. And so because your fears constrain you, and of course he doesn't want to be told he's afraid of anything, um, your fears hold you hostage to the mob. 
<laughs> that's not a mob. Those are people. Um, let a captive set you free. Okay, so you don't have to do it. Um, don't don't seem to act for me. Just look the other way, right? Just give me a private meeting with Polymaster, right? So passive aggressive. So here's a typical woman in a patriarchy being passive aggressive, punching the men's buttons, <laughs> knowing how to manipulate. Um, and he thinks, well, women aren't going to be able to do this. They aren't strong enough. And Hecuba is like, yeah, just, that's okay. Just give me a chance. We'll take care of it. Uh, <laughs> um, so he does. He a lot. He sends a messenger to Polymaster saying that Hecuba wants a meeting with you. And and uh, Agamemnon says, if there were a wind, I wouldn't grant this. But here we are with nothing to do. And she says, the best of luck. I wish you luck. Um, it's in on his last claim, it is in the interests of both states and individuals that evil suffers evil and good fares well. Well, yeah, that principle is true, but this is an absolutely bad choice about what to do in his situation. Um, so that's, um, so it's always, if you think about it, Think about the many, many ways that we think we're doing good things and we're not. And then think about the way other people can manipulate us, flatter us, you know, tell us that we are when we aren't. Or, of course, they can tell us that we're rotten when we're really not. So there's all of this. It's difficult to make judgments. You can believe in these universal principles, but when it comes to applying them, there's so it's really difficult um and so one thing to avoid for sure is manipulation um people who have an interest in you making one choice and then another and will appeal to any sort of character weakness you have so you, you have to be careful um all right so then in the third section um and again i'm going to quit in about Oh, 10 or 15 minutes, and you have to pick something. So that's what I had you read so far. Um, then in the beginning of the third section, the chorus speaks again. And um, her husband was sleeping soundly, and all of a sudden, whammo, I was braiding my hair. So the, the, the vulnerability of human life is the big theme which is why, again, we have to be very careful about making judgments about good and evil leaders do, because life is, is vulnerable enough. All right, so the next section has polymester. And so far, you know, we've seen that Odysseus thinks he's great and he's not. Agamemnon thinks he's free and powerful and he's not. Hecuba is really smart and she knows the good and she knows the bad and she chooses the good and then she changes and she chooses the bad. And um, now Polymester is probably the worst, right? Because he comes, he says, oh, Hecuba, how I pity you and your ruined Troy. You know, he's a total fake. He's a fake and he knows he's a fake. Um, and then he uses this principle. Oh, what can we count on in this life? Nothing. Our reputation, our good fortune, the gods make it all just um, up and down until we're seasick and confused enough to worship them. So life is just one damn thing after another. So we finally we just pray to the gods because I uh, hope that, you know, <laughs> Maybe it'll turn out better. Um, then he lies. I came here as fast as I could. That's a lie. Um, she can't look him in the eye. She says, oh, because I'm so sad. And of course, she's lying to him. Um, then she wants, uh, she wants to be left alone with the boys. And, um, and he says, 
he tells his attendants to go away. He says, I'm safe here. Hecuba is my friend. And the Greek army is well disposed to me, right? <laughs> now he has reasons to think that's true, but it's not. And so he um, he's deluded, right? So he is like a third world city state, right? He is the less powerful city state. And Hecuba has gotten Agamemnon to do it because she appeals to him, you know, we're the superpowers. I remember being a superpower now. <laughs> and so when the, when the nations of the world meet, uh, developing countries have to worry if the developed countries are making these deals among each other, right? At the expense of the developed countries. Or every once in a while, a developed country might think, ah, I have oil in my country and they depend on it. And so I'm going to get the upper hand and then it doesn't pan out that way. Uh, but anyway, it's that kind of a dynamic. Um, uh, let's see, how, how can a fortunate person such as I help an unfortunate friend? Of course, he's totally deluded about the situation. Um, so he tells her a bunch of lies about her son and about the money and I, I'm content with the money I have, of course, I've kept it. And so she tells him, uh, well, I have some other gold and I want you to come in the tent and I have some of it saved and then I can tell you where it is uh, back in Troy. And um, he says, oh, that's smart to get us to come into the tent so that uh, nobody hears us, right? So she's calculating. She's doing the same thing Odysseus does. Um, hurry, because the Greeks are restless to sail for home. Um, ah, and then the chorus says, uh, death is the payment the gods demand. Where justice and the gods converge, there's a maelstrom, there's a big storm. Your greed for gold leads you down the road of hell. So the chorus is able to take a principle and apply it to the person, right? So the chorus is the one that says, your greed has led you to hell. Um, so there is good and evil, right? There is this moral principle behind all this stuff that looks so confusing. Um, all right, and okay, okay, and so then she does uh blind him and she kills his kids, and so he's in the tent and he's trying to get out, and then he gets out, and so on the stage, he's on all fours and he looks like a beast, right. Like he and Hecuba are just about frothing at the mouth. They've lost all sense of dignity. Um, where did the wretch, where did she go? I can smell those women. I can smell those Greeks. Uh, oh God, uh, oh gods, I want to gorge on their flesh and bones, rabid for blood, for vengeance. Oh my God, right? So he and Hecuba have both really stooped low and they were the leaders right the chorus says uh this is you know you're suffering this because of your unbearable deeds a heavy-handed god weighs you down with punishment so the chorus is the one that keeps telling people when you act this way you're gonna get it um then he blames women um he blames all women. Women are just horrible. Um, let's see. Ah, then Agamemnon comes in. I hope you. I hope you're following this. Um, so she, you know, kills his kids, stabs him. Then Agamemnon comes, and he pretends to be surprised, right? Um, and he says, "Oh." I will hear your case and I'll hear her case and I will judge you both fairly, which of course he doesn't. <laughs> and so he's lying. Um, he, he has this appearance of being a uh, fair judge. 
Um, then Polly Nestor, when he's making his case, he lies up the kazoo. He says, yeah, I killed Polly Doris, but I'll tell you why. It was for your sake, right? I did it for you, Agamemnon, so that the Trojans wouldn't come back, wouldn't ever come back and take revenge. So I killed their last heir. Um, okay. These are the things I've suffered. I suffered this because I was looking out for you and your interests. Um, and then he says, neither sea nor land have, has ever produced a more monstrous creature than women, right? Uh, he just, and the chorus says, hey, don't blame us. Uh, don't blame us all just because of this one woman and your own troubles. Um, okay, so then Hecuba gets to make her case, right? She says, um, let's see, when someone acts well, he should speak well. And if the opposite, the, his words should be rotten. Glib rhetoric may win us over for a while, but in the end, the smooth talkers die foully. Okay, so Polly Master is not going to succeed with his rhetoric. But Hecuba, this is very ironic because she already used slick rhetoric and won her case and got her revenge. That's how she did it. She used rhetoric. And so she's saying, you know, rhetoric works for a while, but in the end, no. Well, it's totally ironic. It does work sometimes. Um, then, so she, explains, you know, why you're lying. If you really cared about Agamemnon, you would have given him that money back during the war when he was struggling, you know, if that's what you really cared about. Um, let's see. And this is another good argument. Hecuba gives a good argument. If you had taken care of my child as you ought have to have and kept him safe, you'd earn respect and honor and be worthy of fame. Hard times prove the honest friendship of good men, while prosperity always has friends. If at some point you were in need and Polydorus was doing well, my child would have been a great treasury for you. As it is, you have no friend in Agamemnon. Your gold is gone, your children is, are gone. So this is true. So one of the themes is that actually justice pays and injustice harms. You don't have to be a so-called realist that says, you know, people who are just are just uh, naive, you know, they're gonna get it in the end. And uh, people are cynical and calculating. Those are the ones that win out in the end. Real politic, you know. And, but that's not true here. It really is true that if he had kept her son and, and the money safe, his city would be respected, right? Nobody would invade his city. People would respect him and his people. He represents his people. These people just can't treat their cities like dirt, you know, pawns. So now his people have nothing. They're, the city has a terrible reputation and they don't have a leader. Um, but if Hecuba had taken that freedom, her city would have a reputation, but she didn't, right? And if Agamemnon had not let Hecuba get that, um, that uh, private meeting, if Agamemnon had actually respected hospitality, then his city would have gotten respect and people would have thought the actual motive for going to war was actually hospitality agreements but <laughs> it's not like in the Iliad the, the motive was power that's what Agamemnon cares about and um, Odysseus right sex power and, and sex and so they're no different than anybody else and they're all barbarians um Let's see, and Hecuba, again, Agamemnon, if you side with Polynester, you endorse evil, right? 
you know, and that's, that's just leaping way up to a principle apart from the circumstances. And then Agamemnon, again, he, he says, oh, it pains me to sit in judgment of other people's troubles, but I have to. What kind of a leader would I be if I pushed the case aside, having agreed to take it up? So here's your, my verdict. Polymester, you're guilty. Um, okay, so obviously Agamemnon's are, you know, he's not a fair judge. Um, he accuses Polymester, you've misconstrued the facts to put yourself in a more favorable light. It's exactly what Agamemnon does. Maybe to you, killing a guest is a small matter, but we Greeks think of it as a terrible murder. Well, <laughs> Agamemnon, you just allowed Hecuba to kill, you know, your the the guest, the person who had given you hospitality. You're no better than Hecuba, and he's again, he's so self righteous, and he, I think he actually believes that. We Greeks, you know, we don't kill, um, kill a guest, uh, <laughs> but we let somebody else, you know, let's see. And so then he, uh, Polymester realizes he's lost, but he also, it dawns on them that they're in cahoots, even if he can't see it. So he, he tells Hecuba, he says, you're going to turn into a dog and you're going to get tied onto a ship mast and you're going to drown in the ocean and you'll have a reputation for being the ultimate bitch, okay? A wretched bitch. And she says, I don't even care. I don't care. I got my revenge. Um, and then she says, he says to Agamemnon, well, he says Cassandra's going to get killed by Clytemestra, and Agamemnon's going to get killed by Clytemestra because Agamemnon had to kill their oldest daughter before he left, and Clytemestra is holding a grudge, and she's going to kill him. And but he tells Agamemnon, and Agamemnon is so mad that somebody, you know, questions him that he says, gag this guy and put him out on, on a desert island. In other words, kill him. I mean, he can't do anything if they did that. And so his pride is poked, right? Wounded. Uh, Polly Muster is um, finding a weak spot, right? And um, so then at the very end, the last line, the chorus says, is necessity is hard. Okay, so that again, that's a reversal. None of this was necessary. This was choice, right? And the necessity is just that you do uh, have to suffer the consequences of your choices. But if you're a leaker, your people suffer the consequences. And so when these plays are being performed in front of the public, right? They know that the playwright is trying to educate leaders in how to rule for the sake of the world, trying to educate the citizens to be able to detect rhetoric um, and pride and greed and not to get, uh, manipulated by the privileged class. They're teaching us to have empathy for the slaves. He's basically teaching all these self-critical skills so that, the, so that the citizens can govern themselves and avoid um, authoritarianism because they take care of themselves, they take care of each other, they don't need somebody to fix it, right? And they, they can spot good rulers, they can spot bad rulers, um, they care for everybody, and they'd be able to sustain a free and open society over generation after generation. So that's what it's all about, really. A whole culture that's trying to educate people to be able to think about public affairs and avoid all the corruptions and have a good eye of the soul 
for knowing corruption when they see it. All right, so I'm now gonna give everybody a chance. Um, all right, Poppy, do you have a comment? Poppy? Okay, um, Jereen, do you have a comment? All right, Rupia, do you have a comment? Okay, so you really should, okay, no, okay. Um, so please uh, type something in the chat so that I know that you're there. I do need to know that you're there. Uh, Nahida? Uh, yes, Professor. Um, so we found Hikiva who thinks her, she is the best in the world. She knows her uh, fault, but he don't like that. She don't like that admit. From Hikiva and other characteristics, what I have understood is it's trying, the play is trying to give, give us masses on human life and humanism. We have power, we have grief, we have our own choices, but every time we should look for a hope, um, helpful way. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, let's see, May, I'm gonna skip you until I make sure everybody else gets a chance. Is that okay? Okay, okay, it's okay. Okay, Louis. Um, yeah, um, I take away a lesson that materialism is not a thing important in our life. Um, we we usually experience like a short I think a short term happiness when we buy something, or we have the house, the car. But I think after that, uh, the the level of happiness will return return to the the normal level very soon after that. So I think a uh, material in us the the thing that bring to us the long term happiness. Okay, I do think that the play is trying to show you that ultimately it would be better to aspire to be like Polyzina because you would want at the end of the day to have done noble things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jana Tool? Okay. Lakin? I'll pass. Oh, Untari. Is she there? Okay, so you don't have anything to say? Okay, so Margia? Okay, um, Rossi. I hi, professor. I find the part when um, the Thracian friend who killed Hecuba's son fascinating because he killed because he wanted the gold that was given to that son when he was trying to find a secure place and like his dad thought that that was a safe place for him and that would make sure that to be able to grow up and I feel like this is what happens in real life we can't always trust our friends or people that we encounter with because we don't know their intentions and although we consider them our friends but they even kill like our most precious thing in life just for a bit of gold and that is something that we should um, learn and be really careful about going forward in life. Good. So the plays show you how vulnerable we are and how interdependent we are. And that's why friendships are so important, right? Um, and betraying friendships is really, really serious. Is that, is that right? Yes, it's just tragic to see how like 
a friend can turn their back on you and kill someone you really love just for like a piece of gold and like I feel like life is way more valuable than that piece of gold okay good it happens for pride sometimes when people are competitive it's really sad you know um so so it is you know learning to value friendship friendship bonds more than other more superficial things um news rot Uh, Fahima. Okay. Um, Bondona. Yes, ma'am. Uh, like, uh, if we talk a uh, true, uh, true means like, uh, means uh, from the old book, uh, holy books, uh, from like Hindu, uh, Hindu religion, I can pick Krishna and Sudama. They uh, they uh, saw the true meaning of friendship because like Krishna was uh, like God uh, uh, like he was a Lord and like he uh, uh, when he studied in Gurukul uh, uh, his friend was Sudama so when they uh, were uh, when they grow grew up uh, so they were apart like Sudama became saint like he was a priest and like he was a very old uh, poor priest uh, he didn't have anything uh, to eat or he uh, in search of food he used to roam from house to house one house to another house sometimes he used to get food and sometimes he, he doesn't used to get food so like one day uh, what happened like uh, sudama's wife told uh, him uh, that uh, your friend krishna is very rich so just uh, you go and ask some help from him and if he help and we, if we get success, uh, uh, means he uh, just uh, his Sudama's wife told him to go to Krishna and ask for help because they were suffering from uh, like poverty. So uh, by listening uh, 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 his wife what uh, Sudama went to, Chris, to meet Krishna uh, and he was uh, like a king, like he was a lord and everybody obeyed him he has a big palace and like when sudama went uh, like in spite of uh, krishna uh, krishna in spite of being a king he like uh, welcomed sudama and like and uh, he ate food with him and like he's, he did, he like he treated him like a friend in his palace so uh, when Sudama went to him to ask for help, uh, 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 instead of uh, when Krishna asked, uh, uh, do you need anything from me? Then uh, Sudama said, no, I don't need anything from you. I just came to see you. From, uh, see you. Then like Lord Krishna had the spiritual to know his feelings. So like he knew that he had come for help. He was suffering. He was very poor. So like... Uh, when uh, Sudama went back to his home without saying anything, uh, like Krishna, uh, with his power, uh, like converted his whole like poverty, like his uh, life into luxurious life. Like uh, what I will say. Uh, Means he was poor, he lived in a very poor house and his house was converted into a palace and his children were given uh, clothes to wear and they have a lots of food uh, uh, food to, uh, for their like to eat. And like, yeah, and like uh, when Sudama reached his original home, he was like, uh, uh, like he was in song. Uh, have I come to another place? Because his everything was uh, like his property was converted into a luxurious life and he was just wondering and like and like when his uh, wife said that uh, you have asked uh, when he reached uh, he uh, reached his home he was like even he didn't recognize his wife because his wife was so well dressed and she was looking so beautiful that he can't even recognize his wife and like uh, when his wife uh, uh, Say that I am your wife, and like Lord Krishna came, and he have converted everything into this, and like he was very happy, and like 
yes uh, without uh, uh, like uh, miss uh, like what i will say they are showing the true meaning of like friendship and without uh, saying anything they could understand each other okay <laughs> and um all right so elizabeth Um, Dr. Beck, Elizabeth already left, and do you mind if I go ahead and talk real fast and then go to, because both of us have to get up for work tomorrow. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting. You need to keep reminding me. Okay, Sam, go ahead. All right, let me pull my notes back up real quick. So I'm just going to talk about some things that, like, people have said in class that I really liked. Um, one was about, like, being materialistic and how it's not supposed to be the importance of life and how it's not supposed to be like your focal point, but with our society currently, I mean, we're completely materialistic. So it's like, we've learned nothing from, you know, old plays and stories. Um, and I think that um, focus, like one of your main focus of life outside of being happy and being yourself is that you need to have good intentions on how you interact with other people and stuff um, instead of being instead of being materialistic or supporting the patriarchal society and, you know, things like that. Um, and then another thing that was talked about was like being careful who you trust and who your friends are. Um, and I think that's really big in society right now because you never really know who you can trust. Um, and I have an example of that. I have a friend, I'm not gonna name who it is, um, but this friend of mine I found out was friends with a known um, harasser, basically. And my friend was like, well, he's a great guy. There's nothing wrong with him. And I was like, um, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> and now I'm no longer friends with that person. So I think that shows that like you need to be careful who you can trust because I trusted that person a lot and told um, that person a lot of things about myself and just to have it thrown back into my face basically so I just think that that kind of shows like you need to be careful who you trust because people can either betray you turn their back on you or support people that you're against basically right. and that can be damaging to you as a person too so you have to have friends who are good people too Otherwise, yeah and then that just part was is I thought that friend was a good person. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. It's the most thing is virtue pays in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It but does, um, it that's kind of all I wanted to say. Yeah. So. Okay. Good. Well, good night. Sorry. Good night. Gotta, no, you're good. You have to keep reminding me. I keep forgetting. You're good. Liz already left because she has to get up earlier yeah, than I do, but we both still get up early for work. So I'm so sorry. No, you're good. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah. But the whole idea is that in the long run, you know, you'd rather be virtuous than have virtuous friends that you can trust. If you if you aim for vice, you have, you know, you depend on people who also have their own ulterior motives. Uh, you end up making victims of the best people. You know, you kill the best people. You end up depending mutually on the worst people. Um, okay, May, what you got? One more and then we'll go. Yeah, um, actually regarding the leadership and ruling lifestyle, like we discussed in Hercuba, I also want to discuss a bit regarding the leadership in like the current world, like the international relation and everything. Because um, actually I learned in one and another class about different like international relation theories and how like each leadership leader of like, some nations come to con let like, some to some of the decisions. I feel that like actually it's really hard to define like morality and ethics because it's kind of a very flexible term. Like we don't we don't always know like something is absolutely right or wrong. It's just like um, the opinion. Um, and also maybe there are some some decisions in international relations we defy it as unethical but like the leader need to struggle a lot to really come to that conclusion maybe because they really need to prioritize the national interest and like um the citizens well-being like before everything else which is um the 
realism, for example, but also there are many other like theories which can explain, can justify like why some leaders come to some certain position, uh, some some certain conclusions and decisions. So I think I think that yeah, it's really kind of hard to make choices, even when like as leaders, um, choices can really like um, defy like who we are and how we do because. Um, like you said before, like um, maybe some the leaders in the story, like Hercules and Odysseus, they they may understand like the virtues, the Aristotle virtue, and everything, and they have good opinion. But when it comes to choices, there are many things like affecting that, so they cannot really make good decisions sometimes. So that's what I feel. Good, that's great. Yep. Um, so. Actually, you know, it, it's nice to combine this. This is the more personal stuff. And then you can also read uh, history and you can read theories of leadership. Um, but the theories are only as good as the character of the people of the person leading, right? They can get really manipulated. So it's it's complicated. If you remember when we talked about the Greek gods and goddesses, whenever they went to an extreme, they did suffer consequences, right? They have their midlife crises. They get isolated and alone. Um, so I'm gonna let you go, but um, I'll see you in a couple of days. And please bring something to say next time. Everybody should have something next time. <laughs>